It's Wednesday, it's 12.15 and we're live in Westminster. Boris! Thank you very much, Boris! thank you. Boris! Boris Johnson makes a last minute entrance to the election campaign. None of us can sit back as a Labour government prepares to use a sledgehammer majority to destroy so much of what we have achieved. But as one of Rishi Sunak's cabinet ministers all but concedes defeat, is it too little too late? Keir Starmer is campaigning in Wales, Scotland and England in a final campaign dash. There are a lot of undecided voters still, lots of constituencies that will come down to a few hundred votes that make the difference. And it's the final day for election stunts like this. We'll reflect on the campaign across the UK. With me today, Northern Ireland Secretary Chris Heaton-Harris, Shadow Work and Pension Secretary Liz Kendall, LBC presenter Nick Ferrari and Guardian columnist Gabby Hinsliff. This is Politics Live Election 2024. Welcome to viewers on BBC Two, BBC iPlayer and BBC News. So yes, the day before polls open, bright and early tomorrow. Let's take a look at the front pages. On the mirror, is it coming home? 14 years of hurt, never stopped us dreaming with Sir Keir Starmer, the Labour leader there on the front page. A more prosaic front page for the eye, prisons crisis for new government on day one, with cells full and one in, one out plan. The Times, looking there, as you saw in the headlines, at the former Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Big Labour win is pregnant with horrors, he said. Uh, and the Daily Telegraph also looks at Boris Johnson. It's not too late to stop Labour. And the Daily Mail... Finally, Boris and Rishi unite. Actually, they didn't quite unite. They were separate. But anyway, to stop Starmer Geddon. So those are the front pages the day before polling. Let's turn to Boris Johnson, the former Conservative Prime Minister. Last night, he made a surprise speech at a Conservative rally in Chelsea. Let's take a listen. If you feel you've got a few thousand to spare, <laughs> then vote Labour on Thursday. If you want uncontrolled immigration and mandatory wokery and pointless kowtowing to Brussels again, then go right ahead, make my day, vote for Starmer. But if you want to protect our democracy and our economy and keep this country strong abroad by spending 2.5% of our GDP on defence, which Labour still refuses to commit to, then you know what to do, don't you, everybody? Yeah. There's only one thing to do. Vote Conservative on Thursday. Chris, vintage Boris Johnson, you might say, but is it just too little too late? Um, well, he's been helping throughout the campaign, even though he's been away. He's been helping lots of Conservative candidates uh, throughout, the, throughout the piece with letters and endorsements and, and what have you. Um, and, and the polls is, haven't moved. And it is vintage <laughs> Boris Johnson. And the thing I love about vintage Boris Johnson is that he's bang on the money. You know, Labour's going to cost you a lot more in tax. Labour's going to be rubbish at controlling migration. Mm. And the best, best thing about it is that you lovely media uh, folk can't stop talking about him. And that helps get the Conservative message across. Is that true, Liz? You're shaking your head. No, I think it will remind people while they were in COVID lockdown, the Tories were partying and it was one rule for them and one rule for everybody and else. Keep us in it, will, it will remind people, I mean, it was you who kept my city in lockdown for the longest ever period and your, we're still suffering who to as keep a result. Even longer than uh, we it will remind people that there have been five prime ministers, seven chancellors, all the chaos that there's been. It will remind people uh, what a divided party the Conservatives are. And I think what... Uh, Chris and Boris Johnson have just said shows really how out of touch people are. They know that they are paying more in taxes and getting less in their public services. They know that it's under the Conservatives that immigration has soared and the sm small boats are still arriving. And they'll know that unless they vote Labour for change tomorrow, they'll get five more years of what they've had over the past 14 years and that it is time for change. Uh, help or a hindrance, do you think, the appearance of Boris Johnson? All right, Chris has said he's been there behind the scenes, but sort of publicly there. Well, he injected some energy, didn't he? He talked about how it's an administration, a Labour administration, pregnant with horrors. He's a man who knows more about pregnancy than many, one could argue. But it was interesting how listeners to my show took to it, because for those who don't know, LBC is a phone-in show, 
And I have to tell you, to Liz's point, a lot of people were saying, why are they putting him up? Mm. That is Partygate. That is PPE scandal. That is all the MPs that he backed. So mm. I can see why they did it. Come on, it's like if you're running the England football team and you've got, I don't know, Harry Kane was out there, but you've got a great player. We're not doing particularly well. Let's hurl him out there and see what he can possibly do. I get why they did it. Candidly, and when I knew I was coming to see you, mm. I actually quickly did a, a sort of tally. I would say for the callers to my show, actually it backfired. I'd say about 65% actually did not like. It. Interesting. I mean, it was, a, it was always going to be a gamble. Always going to be a gamble. It got them the attention. Chris is right. But actually, I think a lot of people thought, that's exactly what I don't want to see anymore from the Tories. I mean, it was also this awkward juxtaposition of Boris Johnson, previous Prime Minister, and Rishi Sunak, the current Prime Minister. It was like one of those awful family reunions in some ways because they didn't actually appear together. Or worse still, it was like a little... It felt a little bit humiliating, to be honest, for Sunak because there's this feeling of... You know, having kept him at arm's length for the entirety of the campaign, for all the reasons we've just discussed, that a lot mm. of people just look at him and think, oh, my God, that's what I've had enough of. You know, to then have to bring him in at the last minute. And he actually said at the beginning, you know, I was glad when he sort of called me for help. Like, you know, as he's drowning, I thought I would gracefully throw him a life belt. You know, and you had David Cameron not, in the room. I suppose. David Cameron in the room as well. Too, and you're just thinking two Tory leaders who've won elections and one who we all know is not going to, there was, it was a sort of sign of desperation, I think, dragging him in at this stage. Because the people who love... And there still are people out there who love Boris, and many of them, you know, yep. attempted to vote reform. Yep. But I think a lot of them are thinking, oh, God, if we had him, we'd have won this time. You know, it's just reminding them of what they don't like about Rishi Sunak or the feeling that, you know, he doesn't quite... Chris, do you want do to respond to the critiques you've heard? Um, yeah, I mean, apart from the fact I think they're all rubbish. Um, I think <laughs> I, I, no, I, I, I understand what Nick, uh, Nick's point, especially because uh, you know, Boris is is Marmite um, in, in general terms. But if you look at the group of people who lent their vote to the Conservatives last time, and it was a, a, a loan of a vote, mm. and the people that we do need to vote tomorrow to stop a, a, a Labour majority. Um, and who are either likely not to vote or are likely to vote for a reform and therefore get a Labour majority, even though they don't stand, stand for anything that these people want. Um, Boris is the right person to articulate that message. Well, it all started uh, earlier this morning because the Work and Pension Secretary, Mel Stride, who's been in this studio a number of times, on your show even more times, I think, uh, but he all but conceded the election. Let's take a listen. I, I totally accept that where the polls are at the moment means that tomorrow is likely to see the largest Labour landslide majority, the largest majority that this country has ever seen, much bigger than 1997, bigger even than the national government in 1931. What therefore matters now is what kind of opposition do we have, what kind of ability to scrutinise government is there within Parliament? Mission of defeat. Uh, no, what Mel said is if the polls are right, then it will be a Labour supermajority, and we are working to make sure that the polls are wrong. I, I've, I've said all, all the way through my lovely political career um, uh, that I don't think we should have polls during the course of uh, the last two weeks of an election, for sure. In fact, maybe not even the course of an election, because... Um, that's what has been setting a narrative mm. rather than uh, many of the issues on the doorstep. So you think you can win the election? No, I think we could. I, I think there are lots of votes at play. I mean, I mean, one thing I think all the camps are, are, are sure about is there are a huge number of undecided voters. Uh, Keir Starmer was saying it himself this morning. Um, and where they vote will determine the size of any Labour majority. I mean, no, the way I interpret it, Chris, is that he has effectively now its damage limitation. But how do you respond, respond to what Suella Bravman, who she's written in the Daily Telegraph, saying it is over, we now need to prepare for opposition? And she's another fairly prominent Conservative. Yeah, yeah no, I'm, I'm a great believer. You fight to the you fight to the bitter end, no matter what what's happening. And the more of those undecideds that we but she's not undecided. No, she's, uh, yeah, I mean no, she's here. The Daily over. Telegraph. It's over. We failed. Yeah, the former Home Secretary says party needs but to rediscover size... its soul and move back to the right to reconnect yeah. with voters. Do you agree with her on that? Uh, probably not on uh, on that because I think we are a party of the, the the whole of we encompass the whole of the right and the broader the Church of the Conservative Party, the more chance we have of winning. Um, but we do need to. I mean, going back to the point about uh, is, is she right? Have we have we lost? The polls suggest that we have lost. But we need to win every vote to make sure that we on uh, uh, you know, Labour have an effective opposition. The one thing today I will agree with Chris on is that there are so many undecided people. 
the benefit of actually going out Uniquely and knocking, so, do you think, on, knocking on doors on knocking on doors mm. is and, and looking at the data is I know how many people have still not made up their minds and it is not over until the ballot uh, closes at 10 o'clock at night and that is why after this show I'll be getting on a train and mm. going I won't mention the constituency no, because then thank you. but uh, right until the very very end and tomorrow as well being in marginal seats as well as my own because so many people mm. are still undecided and I am a child of my political upbringing I remember the 92 election and the morning mm. after yep. how I felt and woke up and got that shock. I can't help but be shaped by that, as are many people in this campaign. Nobody's voted uh, yet uh, and we have to get over the line. So that is the one thing that I think is missing from this. But because we knock on doors, we know just how many people, particularly well, in that, those marginal seats, And we're going to discuss undecided. that um, with Kelly Beaver from Ipsos Mori in a few minutes' time. But this idea that Keir Starmer has posited a voter support Depression. That's what conservatives are doing. Uh, Mel Stride and others is trying to say to people, you don't have to bother to go out and vote. And if so, it's not really working very well, I wouldn't say. But I, I do think there is a, you know, the Labour fear is exactly as Ursula just said, you know, that you have to keep fighting till the very end because don't let people take it for granted. And also don't let people think, well, if Labour's getting a huge majority, I can safely vote Green or I can safely protest vote Lib Dem or I can safely protest vote something else. You know, so they clearly, they do fear this narrative that, that you know, it's all over. Labour's got it in the bag. But I don't think... I, can, I don't think it's kind of driving people. I think the fear the Tories have is of, of their what's left of their vote, sitting at home, sitting out, not even, but not just being undecided about how to vote, but even when they think they're voting Tory, thinking I can't actually bring myself to go to the polling station and do it, you know. And I can see that being a realistic fear, people just sitting on their hands. Nick, well, I'm informed by these folk. I mean, they're the ones who are out there knocking on doors mm, in their own mm, ward, which mm. I won't mention, and other constituents, which mm, I also won't mention, mm. and both of them are as one. And you don't often get two parties at the moment united. There clearly are the There are votes out there to play for. So I can now see why your bloke and your bloke are working so hard. There, there, there's still a fight out there, which, again, puzzles me with what Suella said, what Suella said. Right. Well, uh, that's because, do you know, this is all about the sort of never-ending psychodrama within the Tory party, and she's leaping out first. But I think that just reminds people of a party that is all about about these internal battles, not about their battles with paying their bills and trying to get to see the GP. And you know, she, uh, uh, that is, that's the real, the real issue here is about people saying, we want a government that's focused on us and our needs and concerns. And seeing Boris Johnson and seeing uh, uh, um, Suella Braverman is just reminding them of that. Well, you should be focused on us, not yourself. They want a government uh, with a plan, and yours yet, yet to articulate yours. Well, I will Even come on to the plan. Before, we'll come on to our plan. You and... might not like. We have a plan. You might not like it. That's fair enough. Disagree with us on that, but don't say we don't have one because we do. All right. Well, let's check in uh, with the Conservative campaign bus because my colleague. Nick Erdley is travelling uh, with the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. Um, Nick, the story today is very much um, that sort of concession of defeat, if you like, well, all but conceding uh, defeat, damage limitation, whatever you want to call it, by Mel Stride. Yeah, and it's pretty extraordinary, isn't it, Joe, the day before polling for a senior cabinet minister. Remember that Mel Stride is very close to Rishi Sunak. He is a key ally in the cabinet. For him to be out saying not just that you're probably going to get a significant Labour majority, but also the other bit that struck me was when he said, what matters now is the type of opposition we have. I mean, look, there are two reasons for it. One is to try and target those wavering former Tory voters who may be tempted to not vote or to back reform. It's to say to them, look, be careful what you wish for. If you don't back us, you could end up with a significant Labour majority. The second reason is to maybe inject a bit complacency into the Labour vote. Although I've got to say, when you chat to people in the Labour Party privately, they're pretty adamant that that's not going to happen. But yeah, look, I mean, Rishi Sunak hasn't gone as far. We asked him a number of times about this sort of thing yesterday and he was, he was adamant he would fight until the last minute for every vote. He actually told me that he wouldn't be doing this if he didn't think he could still win. But whatever Chris says privately, a lot of Conservatives have been saying this for some time, that they're not going to win tomorrow, that they fear a pretty historic drubbing. And I think today for Rishi Sunak, 
is all about the core vote, which is one of the reasons that we're on a bus to Hampshire just now and not travelling around parts of the country that are normally swing seats. Yeah, well, indeed, that's interesting in itself. Thank you very much, Nick Hurdley, there on the Conservative campaign bus on the last day of campaigning. Now, tomorrow, uh, Jeremy Vine, uh, another of my colleagues, will continue a long-standing election night tradition operating the iconic swingometer from Cardiff as part of the BBC's coverage. Let's take a little preview. So here we are in BBC Cardiff just constructing our path to the door of our own 10 Downing Street here. And let's just remember what Labour need to do to win this election, if they can win it, is that they need to gain 125 odd seats just to get a majority of one, just to get Keir Starmer through that door. May not sound very difficult, but it sure is because they would need a swing of 12.7%. That's more than even Tony Blair got in 1997 with his landslide. So it's no pushover for Labour, this. We're going to find out what happens on election night with our programme on BBC One, which starts at 5 to 10 with myself and Laura Koonsberg and Clive Murray and others. And I hope to see you then. Well, that was uh, Jeremy Vine setting out uh, the massive task ahead uh, for Labour in terms of swing and number of seats they would need to win uh, to form the next government. Um, in a moment, we'll just show you the poll tracker, the BBC poll tracker. But let me introduce Kelly Beaver, the chief executive of Ipsos UK and Ireland. Hello to you, uh, Kelly. The polls have consistently uh, shown a 20 point lead for Labour ahead of the Conservatives. And it is still 19 points, still the case as you can see there. If you look at the lines, both Labour and the Conservatives have dropped a little uh, bit. Um, despite the massive swing needed by Labour, as set out by Jeremy Vine, is Mel Stride, the Cabinet Minister, right that the party is heading for a massive majority and a massive victory? It does look to be that way. We've got the Labour sort of lead sitting at a similar sort of level to that, but we expect them to take around... 453 seats, which is a 256 seat majority, so quite a sizeable lead. I think one of the questions I often get asked is about whether or not we will see much of a shift in the voting intentions over the last few days mm. of the campaign. And when you look back across all of the electoral events at scale since 1979, which is the as far back as we hold that data, you can see that on average, things might move the gap between Conservative and Labour about three points. It is the exception rather than the rule that it moves more than that. And on two occasions, we have seen it move to the extent of five points. And that was in 97 and in 2001, both of which where uh, Labour had a strong lead and that actually slipped back a little bit. But worth noting that today we still have a high proportion, comparatively to previous elections, who are undecided. It's still sitting at around 36% of voters who are undecided mm. today. And if at the same point in 2019, that was in the mid-20s. Right. I mean, it's interesting because that's been some of the discussion here mm. is exactly, is it anecdotal? Um, it's certainly been reported, this idea of undecided, unknowns. Um, I have to say, even in my own experience, more people have asked me um, this time, oh, who should I vote for? Um, as if I know and would give any indication. <laughs> but it just is an interesting sort of reflection of the campaign. Um, but now you've set out the figures, you don't think it's particularly, or it is particularly, unique? Not really. I think there are a couple of things though that can also shape the last few days, not just those don't knows. Turnout, looking at all the data mm. that we have, it does, it, there are indicators that turnout is going to be specifically low during this, uh, during this election. If you look mm. at 2019, at the, the same point, they were telling us 74% of people were saying they were going to turn out, ends up being about 67%. At this point in time, we've got 65% of voters saying that they're 10 out of 10 going to turn out to vote. Mm. And we know that they overestimate in the surveys where they tell us this. So we would anticipate something in the lower 60s or perhaps even lower than that again. Now, turnout could have an impact on the ultimate votes that are cast and some of those marginal constituencies could be impacted by that too. Yes, I mean, the number of seats where you are looking at tens of thousands of yeah. votes um, and people give a figure for the number of constituencies that we're talking about on both sides of the sort of mainstream party uh, spectrum, how important is that? Could it really swing in terms of that number of seats, perhaps mm. a dozen, 20, 30, on a very small number of votes? So we have 117 constituency mm. seats where we believe it's a toss-up. And so you can see wow. things like the turnout numbers, 
the reallocation of those don't knows and also tactical voting. We have one in five people telling us they will vote tactically during this election. Mm. Those three factors, I would say, could play into some variations for, on those marginal seats. Mm. And at this stage, that, those would be, uh, that, that would be what I would be watching. Right. I mean, Kelly, a final thought from what you have said. If there is a lower turnout than perhaps we have been expecting, and yet we could be seeing a big political yes. change, we could be seeing this big majority for Labour. What does that say about enthusiasm for that big shift? So when you look across things like the turnout numbers, it just shows you the political disengagement in, in the country mm. today. We also know that trust in politics and politicians is at a record low from the British Social Attitudes data and our own veracity data. So I think that that is baked in. There's also a challenge around proving competency in government again. And when we ask people about what, what's their expectations of a Labour government, I would say they're still quite muted in terms of the positivity around what they expect is going to be delivered. They, they also were concerned and think they will have tax rises. They think that there will be more spending. They think there'll be improvements in things like focus on public services, etc. But one thing that comes across really clearly People do want change. We've seen a rise in that over the last six weeks, saying it's time for a change at this election, moving from 73 to 78%. And sometimes you can get caught up in the noise. Mm. And if you pick yourself out of that and look at the macro picture, the mood of the nation is a desire for change. Kelly Beaver, thank you very much. Your reflections on what you've heard? Well, uh, when Chris said at the start of the show, I don't think we should have polls, I thought he was bonkers. But I now understand what you're saying, because clearly these polls... And I just I wanted to... There are 117 mm -hmm. seats still effectively I mean, in it, play. It, I mean, I don't get out enough. These guys do. <laughs> because it is not as we are seeing it in SW1. So to your point, which I thought you were absolutely... Mad, I can see why you would say that some of the polls are quite damaging, Chris. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's... it's uh, I, I have been out, and I'm, I know Liz has been out as well uh, around the country. And um, the algorithm that gives the 117 too close to call is an algorithm. It's not people. Um, and we've been talking to people, and we both know there are tons of undecided that, learn, that we do know that turnout's going to be really low. And I first got elected in 1999 in a European elections when Tony Blair was at his height, but turnout was a disaster across the country. But Tory votes turned out in, in areas uh, where they probably weren't expected to, and I got in. I mean, there's, there, is a, there is a reason why. What we're saying is, if you want change, you have to vote for it. It's not a line. Mm. It's a fact. Mm. And when you've got over 100 of seats, still within the margin of error, when you have um, up to a third of voters undecided, when people, it is true, one of the biggest challenges we've had is people have had the hope kicked out of them for the last 14 years to get out and convince them that politics actually matters and can make a difference. That is why we say we're fighting for every last vote and why we don't believe the, the polls. But Gabby, is, is, there, is there a sense, perhaps the lack of enthusiasm that has been talked about it, apparent or real, is there an expectation that if Labour wins that perhaps not enough will actually change? It'll change as in there'll be a new government and a new party, but their lives might not change very much. I think what I've been really struck by in the seats I've been to is a sense of not just... <laughs> Not just people thinking, oh, maybe the Labour government won't make a difference. People thinking, no government makes a difference. Losing faith and having lost faith, not just, not just having broken faith with the Tory government that they feel has failed them, but then thinking, that's it, politics itself is, is useless. You know, politics itself can't deliver for me. There are people who voted Brexit because they wanted a change, thought that was going to change <coughs> things, and they didn't. And then they voted Boris Johnson because they thought that was going to be the big change, and that wasn't it. And now they're being asked to vote for another big change and thinking that's not it. And the amount of times I've heard, you know, the enemy in my seat is the sofa, it's it's not my other candidate, mm -hmm. it's people just thinking, you know, stuff a lot of them. But the other thing I thought was interesting, actually, that Kelly said was she picked up on tactical voting and the number of people wanting to tactically vote this time. And certainly where I am and live in Oxfordshire, you know, these are seats where that have always been safe Tory seats, that there's been... People don't know what the tactical vote is because these haven't been seats that have been in play before. And you're seeing that across the country. You know, you can see several seats where there's a will to unseat a Tory candidate, but people, people don't know what is the mechanism to do that. Do they vote Lib Dem? Do they vote Labour? Who's, who's leading? You know, they're swamped with leaflets saying winning here and dubious bar charts. And I think there may be seats where the Tory candidate will survive simply because the anti-Tory vote couldn't decide where to go. Right. Well, let's uh, get the latest from the Labour campaign uh, bus with the BBC correspondent Jess Parker. 
So we're following Sir Keir Starmer today where he uh, has already been in Wales. We're heading to Scotland and then later on we will be in England. So a real dash around the country. And he is continuing to visit seats that Labour didn't win in the last general election. And there is that sense of a, a growing confidence around the Labour campaign, despite the very cautious public messaging. Because, of course, it's the Conservatives who are going around saying that they think the country could be heading for a, a Labour, as they put it, super majority. I asked Sir Keir Starmer about Mel Stride, the work and pensions uh, comments earlier on today, and Sir Keir said they amounted to voter suppression because, of course, what Labour really don't want people to think is that this is a done deal and therefore they don't need to go out and bother voting for them. Hence why we keep hearing Sir Keir Starmer talking about if you want change, you've got to go out and vote for it. Now, as I say, they're pretty cautious in their public messaging. They don't want to look complacent or indeed arrogant. But speaking to Labour activists and campaigners over the last couple of days, the mood is definitely one that is upbeat. And when Sir Keir Starmer came into the room in South West Wales earlier at a venue surrounded by Labour supporters, there was a lot of applause. There was a real buzz in the room. I think within the Labour Party, a lot of them do think they could be on the cusp of being in power for the first time in 14 years. Jess Parker there on the Labour bus. Let me just show you this headline. Uh, Chris, it'd be good to get your comment um, to respond. In the Times, postal vote delays could bar Kemi Badenoch from Tory leadership race. Now, we've had various reports this week about postal ballots being delayed in terms of being delivered uh, to people. The head of the Electoral Commission reckons very few people haven't uh, received them, but apparently there is an issue in Kemi Badenoch's um, constituency, and you can see all the candidates on the BBC website. Uh, they report that uh, over two and a half thousand postal ballots were not sent out, which could uh, trigger a challenge um, depending on the result. What do you make of this? Well, firstly, um, we are fighting for every vote and postal votes across the country have been out there. I made sure that my parents did their postal votes uh, last week and um, they got their postal vote in plenty of time. It's a very straightforward process. Um, and there is no leadership election in the Conservative Party yet. We're trying to get Rishi Sunak re-elected as, as our Prime Minister. And um, so I, I don't know much about what's going on in, in that I'll particular have to part of it. Mm. Um, I mean, they, they do all seem to be lining up, though, don't they, for uh, life after? Well, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm quite sure people always fancy their tilt at the top, as they'll be in the left wing of the of the Labour Party, rubbing their hands with glee that they're going to have a nice high tax government. Um, <laughs> uh, all right, Chris. Well, let's just stick with the the issue here, Nick. I mean, uh, one benefit of what I do is that well, I might not go uh, campaigning as, as you folk do, but I get calls in from all over the country to the show, and there are problems with post without, oh, without yeah, yeah people are ringing in because it's been difficult to gauge exactly how big a problem it's it is great respect the electoral commission saying it's all going fine it's not and right I, I, you know if i was allowed to i give them the, the numbers of all the people and this could if you look geographically if you look at a place like scotland which is your viewers know this is their summer holiday season yeah if a lot of people it's no point saying well go with your form go and vote you'll be all right well they mm. can't because they might be in mallorca or something like that mm. so i do think there's issues and also probably after all the dust has settled I think it's 10 million people are voting by post. Now, I understand in some instances possibly your parents go, there might be issues of mobility or people out of the country. It does seem a very, very high number to do. Right, very briefly. I think in mar there may be some marginal constituencies where if the vote is very, very close and people are saying, but I didn't get my post to vote, I didn't get a chance to vote, then we could see some serious issues coming yeah. up. Right, well, let, let, let's talk about some of the substance and the policies, because there are many people who are struggling, still struggling with the ongoing cost of living crisis. And for many, expectations are low as to whether life will change or improve radically whoever uh, wins the election. Uh, the BBC's Ed Thomas was recently in Grimsby. Let's take a look. We shouldn't have to struggle on minimum wage. And it was here we met Dom. Still counted as homeless. He'd we borrowed cash from the pawn shop. You give them some things, they give you some money for it. And what was the money for? It was just so I could get some food. The cost of living has gotten so ridiculous to the point where I've been homeless three times this year. He struggled for a long time. And then came the cost of living crisis. This is home now, Don. Yep, pretty much. Yeah, it's cosy. YMCA, temporary supported accommodation. My freezer has potato tots and some chicken nuggets. Dom had a zero hours contract in a fish packing factory. But when shifts went down, bills went up. Rent ended up going up four times within a space of six months. It messed me up. I just want to be able to live 
All I've been doing is surviving and pushing through. That's all I can do. It's survive or die. I mean, Liz Kendall, you could be the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions dealing with welfare. How would you sort out Dom's situation? Well, the first thing he talked about is needing a decent home, which is why we have committed to building 1.5 million more homes, which is absolutely essential. Secondly, he talked about you know, being on a zero-hours contract, and we've said we will ban those exploitative zero-hours contracts. We want to see a genuine living wage. And crucially, what he and many others need is to have more, better-paid jobs in every part of the country, which is why our local growth plans, what we're going to be doing on clean energy, how we're going to be transforming skills are so important. Yeah. Because ultimately, we need to see more better paid jobs sure. and people who need but, them getting the skills But let's be honest, for Dom, that. it's not going to change, is it? It's not going to change. Of course, I I, I, you're not a miracle not, worker, but you're not going to change I things on day one, accept, week one, month one. I, I mean, don't accept well, that things are not going to... There has to be a bit of to, a, I don't honesty. accept there is honesty. And, you know, I chair Feeding Leicester, the programme to end hunger in my city. I have one in three children growing up in poverty mm. in my, my city. I know what the housing waiting lists are like. But it does not have to be that way. I do not promise that things change overnight, right. but we can and we will make a start well, straight Well, I've away. read the manifesto and it's vague when it comes to your ambition to tackle poverty. You have set out some of these longer, to, mid, medium to longer term um, housing changes, um, etc. But in terms of that sort of granular level yeah. change to that situation, I mean, Labour candidate Rosie Duffield said to the BBC uh, recently, we're not talking about poverty. We should be aiming to eliminate it, particularly child poverty, as soon as we possibly can. We're scared of promising too much that might harm our poll lead, but we have to be the change the country needs. I don't what agree with the that point? You don't. analysis because that we have a strong commitment on tackling child poverty uh, and a bold cross-government strategy to do that Except at the heart you won't of scrap our manifesto. The two -child benefit cap. That this was not Labour policy and we voted against it. Yeah. But the absolutely critical thing that we have said is we need economic stability and we will only have promises, uh, policies that, we're, that we show how we can afford. And let me tell you, if every single primary school has a free breakfast club so children start, start school with hungry minds and not hungry bellies, that will make a huge difference. If we have 8,500 more mental health workers and mental health support in every school, we will tackle one of the root causes of worklessness that is driving poverty. And if we build those new homes right. and have a genuine living sure. wage, if. that will yeah. make a real... And that's but on I'm the to... basis of if you win. I, I, I understand that. But, but and actually, that we, and that Gabby, we can deliver it because is, it can be different. Is that transformative? There has been an awful lot of disquiet about policies or the lack of them like the two-child benefit cap, because that would, of course, have an immediate effect on poverty and the numbers of children in poverty. Is that an omission, a glaring omission by Labour? I think it is. I've written that it is, and I would be amazed if most Guardian readers didn't agree with me. You know, I can't understand why a Labour government would not change um, something that seems to them so egregious a cause of poverty. But to come back to, to Dom's situation for a minute, I mean, I used to live in Grimsby in the 90s. It's my old local paper patch. You know, 30 years ago, the problem was bringing jobs to Grimsby, and it still is. And, you know, new governments have come in and gone out and said, we'll do something for your area, we'll level it up, we'll, you know, well, different phrases have been used by each government. And you're still struggling with the same problem, which is how do you bring back economic growth to places like that, to towns like that? And governments of, you know, all flavours have struggled with that problem. In that manifesto, Keir Starmer is absolutely banking on bringing back economic growth as the key to unlocking all the mm. other things he wants us to do. I have not yet seen a mechanism that succeeds where other governments have failed in Nick, places like Grimsby. I'm just puzzled, Liz. If you're against the child benefit, why not scrap it? Because we can only make promises when we show how we can afford them. And let me say this on child poverty. I am very proud of the last Labour government's record on that. And we want to build, we want and intend to build on it. And we have already set out some first steps that will make a huge difference. And when 70% of children growing up in poverty are in a working household. And but, that's the big difference oh, between well, now mm. and when we were last just, in government. Just, the finally, worklessness was but, the problem. But finally, briefly, to Gabby's, to Gabby's point, 
I've read about your, in the manifesto these these jobs that these green jobs. How's that going to help Dom, who was once a fish packer in Grimsby? How's so that Grimsby, going to get actually, yeah, offshore wind is the huge new green. It's the one thing that's hopeful. I am in the politics of hope and change, and that I believe that if you can give people the skills they need to get the jobs of the future, perhaps not straight away, but most people you see like that, it is a journey. You have to All get right. people the home, and then you have to get them the skills that they need, build back their confidence, tackle any underlying problems like mental health problems. And I have seen those people. This Just okay. this week, right. I went to a constituency, which Briefly. I won't mention, uh, quite similar on a coastal area, dealing with pe uh, people with mental health problems. A man there who had tried to commit suicide three times and through help on that particular farm he was on, he is now ready to start getting a qualification. Right. It's good possible good and we're determined to do good it. Chris, the truth is that in-work poverty has grown over the last 14 years. That is the Conservative Party and successive conser Conservative government's legacy. It can't be something you're proud of. Well, firstly, I mean, I, th I think you'll find poverty figures amongst children have, got, have gone down. Yeah, in, over, I'm talking about course. people who are working uh, in and, households where someone has a job and they're in poverty. And we've had huge, um, you could say, input from outside. The Ukrainian uh, crisis caused oil prices to go up, energy prices for everybody, where the government then supported them. But the point is that Dom, what Dom wants, and actually uh, you've got to admire people like Dom, because he basically said it himself, he really wants to be, have a job. He wants to get himself out of that hole. Now, it's great having a vacuous and empty plan yeah, like on. Labour but has. It's but your we, record we're talking no, no, about, no, Chris Heaton we, Harris. We are, we're talking we about putting... levelling up. That hasn't happened in these oh, parts. I, in these, hang on, in these parts of the country to the benefit of someone Forgive like me. Dom. And let me just give you the figures. Sixty-one percent of working age adults in poverty lived in a household where at least one adult was in work, and eleven percent of all workers lived in a household in poverty. That's where they're working. You Conservatives and Conservative governments, instead of work being the path out of poverty, it's been the opposite. No, I disagree entirely, what? entirely, because work is, is, is the platform that Dom uh, has already uh, spied as his route out of this. And we have already set up the programmes to give people like Dom uh, uh, access to more skills, to get, uh, get a better jobs. And you'll see from the figures across the nation that actually the unemployment figure, the job seeking allowance figure is going down. What we have now is a lot of people who we need to get back into the workplace with and help them skill up. And that is costed in our manifesto as well, where it's uncosted in the Labour one. Liz? Not true. Uh, f fully costed plans to <sighs> tackle the root causes of worklessness predominantly for younger people, mental health problems, to reform the failed apprenticeship levy, which is not delivering, especially like for, younger, I mean, uh, for younger people. For a Labour we party have to one be in, in that eight position. young people not in education, employment or training. That is terrible for them yeah, but, and the tax. But hang on, Liz, what is the difference between what Chris has outlined in terms of getting more people back into work? Labour is offering something similar. That's what you've said but in your... Matter of fact, you said, said under our Change believe, Labour Party, if you work. can work, yes. there'll be no option of a life on benefits. That's Not just because the British people believe rights right. should go hand in hand with responsibilities. So your strategy is the same. To get more, you obviously think there are lots well, of people off work who should be in work. Uh, you know, we have always believed in work, and I believe that work is good not just not because true. of a paycheck. Because in your document let itself, in your manifesto document for itself. Myself, no, well, hang on, let Chris respond, Liz. Let Chris respond. I don't want you putting there are words zero, in my mouth no, about what I believe in, which is work. Rachel Reeves' document. Let, let him finish his sentence and you come back. Zero savings in the welfare budget. We have got savings because we have a plan to get you do people not. back into Let me tell you, let her respond. There is no money that you've already pencilled this into the baseline. That's what happened at the budget. You have no plans to reform. Uh, PIP, it's all just a consultation, and most of the things you've announced, like reform of the fit note, you did back in 2017. Right, but do you not agree with those? So do I you not agree in reform of the I, sort of culture? I and absolutely right. believe in reform. Number one, I think the benefit system needs to encourage work and support people into work, which is why we've said we'll have an interwork guarantee so that people on sickness or disability benefits, if they get a job, they don't have to, if that doesn't work out, fall back and go through it all again. All we've right. also said we'll tackle the root causes of worklessness, which is poor health for many people, childcare, skills, All right. and crucially, we want a 
a benefit system which focuses on getting people into work and on in their work. That is our plan. And I'm afraid when we have a Accurous situation words. where we have the Accurous record high well, in the number of people if, out of work due if to long-term sex, if you win the election, that's it got will to be, change. you'll be judged, of course, on I delivery. We're going to take a that. little breath, relish it. all of us. Well, I'm going to take a little breath, and so is Liz, <laughs> um, for a moment, while we look back mm. over the election campaign. Rishi Sunak could call an election as soon as today. I don't think there is any uh, sensible appetite for this. We will have a general election on the 4th of July. Are you confident in sinking ship going into this election? <laughs> Our plan to introduce a modern form of national service. I am going to be banned from running for the Labour Party. She is free to go forward as a Labour candidate. <laughs> I've done it before, I'll do it again, I'll surprise everybody. Would you, if you felt that that was the only way forward, use private health care, Rishi Sunak? Yes. Keir Starmer? No. He would put up everyone's taxes by £2,000. He knew he was lying. Hi, Minister. Gosh, hello. Good to see you. Very nice to see you. Hey, sorry I'm to have well, kept you. No, not at all. I know you've been in Normandy. Yeah, it all just ran out. On reflection, that was a mistake, and I apologise. We are sleepwalking into a one-party socialist state. SNP! Did you have inside information when you placed your bet on the election date? Statement. Um, it's an independent process. Well, when I first learned about these allegations, I was furious. If any of my candidates were being investigated by the Gambling Commission, they'd be out the door and their feet wouldn't touch the ground. Significant cuts across other services. Now, we've called this a conspiracy of silence. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are you two really the best we've got to be the next Prime Minister of our great country. And the two men there, Sir Keir Starmer and Rishi Sunak. Reflections. Well, that was joyous and inspiring, wasn't it? I mean, to a sense, to extent, it was all there on the first day, wasn't it? It was there, you know, Rishi Sunak in the rain, thinking, surely, they, surely, surely the rest of the campaign has got to improve from here, surely they won't make these kind of unforced mistakes all the way through, and, and the end, they did. Nick? Ask my listeners for the biggest lowlights. Uh, they were both featured in your uh, in your story there for the Labour Party. It was when Diane Abbott seemed to be running the Labour Party rather than Keir Starmer briefly. And for Rishi Sunak, it was that D-Day desertion. Those are the things that are lingering with some of my listeners. Right. I mean, I saw you, of course, in our uh, pull together yeah. of uh, recollections there at the Titanic. Was that was that a bad move? Oh, go careful, because Faisal uh, Islam, is, he's already said that he made a mistake in saying... Um, Titanic is actually a symbol, the Titanic Quarter in Belfast is a symbol of rejuvenation, of, of rebirth, uh, dynamic eco economic activity and um, having that in the background, having a reborn uh, Belfast in the background. But he was no asked about whether, Rishi Sunak was asked about whether he was the captain of a sinking ship, you were standing right next to him. Yeah, and he's not. <laughs> and still right to the end. Liz, your uh, reflections. I'm really, I'm really proud of the campaign that we've run. We've had a simple message, it's time for change and that's resonated and personally if you like people as i do uh, i love a campaign i love meeting people i love going out knocking on doors visiting people who are actually doing amazing things i'm always you know disappointed we don't get to talk more about the policies there's only one visit i've done where they actually reported on the visit what we were seeing to try and help people work. I am actually optimistic because there are some great people out well, there. Well, a lot of people things. have said there wasn't and, enough um, hope and optimism sort of across the campaign. That. We haven't got long. Prediction, can I ask? Of course you can ask. Um, I think it will be a Labour victory. I don't think it will be high as the polls will be. It's the number that the Conservatives have at the end of the day. Gabby? Labour landslide and the surprises will be how well reform does or doesn't do. Well, that's all we have time well, for. Who do I vote for? You're going to tell me. No, <laughs> I wasn't going to ask you. There's no programme tomorrow because it's polling day, but our election programme, the BBC, starts at 5 to 10 tomorrow evening after the exit poll uh, drops. Well, in fact, it starts before the exit poll drops and then continues throughout the night and the next day. Thank you to our viewers for keeping me company throughout the campaign. Thank you to all of our guests, particularly the ones today, for ending uh, the campaign and also to our wonderful team who have put this programme together for five weeks. We'll be back on Monday. Bye-bye.